First Peter, the third chapter. And while you're turning there, I just want to take a moment to welcome our first time and returning guests. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. Amen. We believe that God has something for you. And uh, you should have received, first time visitors in particular, you should have received a welcome packet. So if you are a first time guest and you haven't received that, or if you're not a first time guest but you never got one, uh, raise your hands uh, and the uh, ushers will bring you one. And one of the things that's in there, there's a lot in there, but one of the things in there is just a card where we ask for some information about you and your visit with us. But on the back there's a section, a special section for prayer requests. And so if there's anything that's going on in your life that you need prayer for, we will be happy to take that to God on your behalf. Amen. I pray for these things personally. And then we have our Saturday prayer each week where a group of people come together and they will pray for it also. So be sure to uh, let us know if you have any prayer requests. Amen. Amen. So in 1 Peter, the third chapter, we thank God for utterance in the spirit today. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. And I want you all to read with me the 15th verse of 1 Peter chapter 3. Ready? Read. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So this scripture is an instruction for the people of God and it says that we are to prepare our hearts to set apart our hearts so that we are always ready. Somebody say always ready. Always ready. No matter who the person, no matter what the question, no matter what the situation, always ready. Always ready for what? To give a defense. To give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. So this is telling us that when people come to us and ask us, why do you think that you are going to heaven? Because that's our hope. Amen. Our hope means our expectation. And our expectation, my expectation, is when I leave this earth, when this physical body drops dead, that the real me is going to heaven to be with the Lord. And if you're in this place today and you've accepted the Lord Jesus, then that's your destiny also. So he's saying that we need to be always ready to give a defense. Now, it's interesting the word defense is used, which presupposes that you will need to defend what you believe. Did you all ever notice that? It presupposes that people will challenge you that people will come against you, that people will ask you to explain why you believe the nonsense you believe. And the Bible is instructing us to always be ready to give that answer, to give that defense, to always be able to explain why it is you think you're going to heaven. So, we have started a series called Why Believe, and in addition to this scripture, there are other reasons why we, this is something that is important to talk about, and we shared some, and if you want to hear the whole thing, you got to get the CD or the MP3. I'm going to recap briefly and then keep moving on, but we started out by sharing some research that was done by a couple different uh, organizations, Pew Research and Barna Research, and what they found was only 54% of Christians Christians believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, which means 45% of them don't. They believe it's something else. We talked about the fact that 65% of Christians believe that there are many ways, many religions lead to eternal life. And we talked about the fact that 38% of Christians say that Jesus definitely will not or probably will not return. Now those numbers suggest a crisis to me because these are numbers that are among Christians. So what it tells us is that we are not doing a good enough job of doing 1 Peter 3.15. That means that we 
are not always prepared to give that answer, to give that defense. And so we started this series and we're going to continue it to help us to uh, understand why exactly is it that we believe. And one of the things that Christians are often accused of is having blind faith. And people say, well, yeah, I'm just not going to just blindly follow some religion or blindly believe in some man who supposedly died on a cross. But what we are learning is that that the Christian faith is far from blind. And we're learning and we will continue to learn that it is actually logical to believe the word of God, the Bible. It's logical. People who don't believe it actually have the problem. So last week, we started putting the gospel of Jesus Christ, we started putting it on trial. Amen? Now, I want to start, I want to actually jump back and, and tell you about an experience I had this week. I went to a conference. Uh, I can't remember the name of the conference, but I went, and it was a, a workshop on youth, young adults. And there was a young man that was speaking, and he said he did some surveying of his peer group of the young adults and he said he broke the feedback down into two categories three categories I'm sorry one of the categories was that the church is ill-equipped this is the perception among a lot of young adults is that they're ill-equipped ill-equipped for what one of the things that they were ill-equipped for was to prepare this is according to this young man who did this research among his peer group that one of the things that they were ill-equipped to do was prepare young people to be solid in their faith so that when they go off to college, they know what they believe, they know why they believe, and they can stand up when people challenge their beliefs. So he said there was a problem in the church of equipping our young adults. So that when they get challenged, and he, one of the things he said was, you know, when they start, when the, when the professors start talking about why the Bible is, is, you can't trust it and all that, if you, this is what he said, his words, if you do not know what you believe, what they talk about starts to make sense. It only makes sense if you don't know what you believe. But be very clear that if you are not solid in what you believe, what other people say makes some sense. But once you understand what you believe and why, what you, what you start to realize is that y'all borderline crazy. I'm not the one that is believing something ridiculous. You are. So we started in on this and we looked at, uh, we started with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and we started to look at uh, how credible the writers of the Gospels were. And I'm not about to go back over it all, like I said, get the CD, get the MP3, but we looked at their character, we looked at their motives, and we looked at their actions to see if their actions were consistent with what they wrote. And what we found was that the writers of the Gospels were extremely credible. Amen? So then we started looking at what we call corroborating evidence because we, have, we arrived at the conclusion based on these um, legal methods, these are methods that lawyers use that the Gospel writers are credible, then we started looking at what we call corroborating evidence, which is evidence outside of the, witness, the witnesses that we've talked to whether or not they say the same thing as these witnesses. Y'all remember that? So turn with me really quick to uh, Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to briefly review some of the corroborating evidence and then continue on with it. So on the 27th chapter of Matthew, here's what we find that Matthew gives in his testimony. Starting in the 45th verse, it says, Now, from the sixth hour, this is when Jesus was up on the cross, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why, for you, why have you forsaken me? Then I want to jump down to uh, verse 50. And it says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up the spirit, or his spirit left his body and his body died. Verse 51 says this, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. So here we have, and this, this, this 
historical account is repeated in some of the other gospels to ver in all of the other gospels to varying degrees of detail but what we have here is the gospels say that when Jesus was on the cross there was darkness over the uh, earth for three hours and that there was an earthquake so that's what the gospels say so now let's look and see if there's any corroborate or let's review the corroborating evidence and see what was found by others who lived in that time anybody interested in that so what we found was there were at least three historians who spoke to this darkness that covered the earth and the earthquake. So we found Thallus, who was a historian. Who in AD 52, he wrote a history of the Eastern Mediterranean world. And here's what he said in the third book of his histories. He said there was darkness over the earth, but what he did was he explained it as an eclipse. But regardless of his explanation, what is, what is he explaining? That there was darkness over the earth. And scholars, after they examined his assertion, what they, what they came to the conclusion of is, given the time of year that this happened, it was impossible that this was an eclipse. But when people have things that they can't understand, they try to craft some kind of explanation. Then we looked at uh, Tertullian, who was another historian, and here's, what he, here's how he described this, uh, this, this darkness that came over the earth. He, he, he described it as a cosmic world event. Amen? Now these are not the gospels, these are not Christians, these are historians. But what they're doing is they're corroborating what's written in the gospels. You follow me? Then the last person we looked at was Phlegon, who was a Greek author and he was writing a chronology of uh, of history and what he said was in the fourth year of the 20, 202nd Olympiad which is actually 33 AD there was the greatest eclipse of the sun and that it became night in the sixth hour of the day what did Matthew say the sixth hour of the day darkness covered the earth so now we have this, this Greek uh, author corroborating that then he says this so that even the stars appeared in the heavens then he says there was a great earthquake in Bithynia and many things were overturned in Nicaea. So we have historians corroborating what is written in the Gospels. You all follow me? So now let's pick up now and continue on. And I want to start looking at the, the uh, Gospel accounts, the historical accounts of the fact that they all write that Jesus was crucified by Pontius Pilate. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who were followers of Jesus, said this is what happened to Jesus. But now let's look at people who weren't followers of Jesus, who were independent sources, some of which were objective and some of which were actually hostile. In other words, they didn't like the whole Christian thing, but as historians, their life is just telling what happened. So what we find is that um, there's a historian named Tacitus. How many of y'all familiar with Tacitus? And so he recorded uh, in one of his history books, now note what he said. He was talking about Nero, Nero who was uh, the emperor of Rome. Um, I think he followed Tiberius who was the, the, the uh, emperor when Jesus was crucified. But here's what he said. I talk writing about Nero. He said, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite torture on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Then he said this, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. So this is a historian Outside doesn't follow Jesus, but he attested to the fact that Jesus was killed by Pontius Pilate. Yeah. Amen. Somebody say corroborating evidence. corroborating evidence. Then let's look at how many of you are familiar with uh, Josephus. Josephus is a Jewish historian. Uh, and I actually have his book, Josephus, the Essential Works. Uh, he's got another book that's called Josephus, the Complete Works. But that book is way too big and the writing is way too small for me to get that one. 
So I got the essential works, which is a much smaller book. And the writing is bigger. And the significance of the writing being bigger and the book smaller is it's less to read. So the other book just intimidated me. But Jewish is a well-known, well-respected, Josephus is a well-known, well-respected Jewish historian. However, he was not a Christian. And he didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But as a historian, he is writing what happened. So in his book, The Essential Works, which is, I guess, the Cliff Notes, this is what he writes about Jesus. He says, at this time, there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. So now you see all these, you can tell he doesn't believe because it was like he was, uh, uh, he, he was known to be virtuous. See all these, I don't really believe this, but this is what, this is what happened. So there was, at that time, there was a wise man. He only, he only called him a wise man. He didn't call him Messiah. He didn't call him Christ. He called him a wise man. So there was a wise man called Jesus and his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah. I told y'all he didn't believe. But even him, you cannot argue with what happened because it, this is what happened. And as a Jewish historian, he understands the law and the prophets. And so he, even he has to admit that this is what happened. And so he is perhaps the Messiah. And he says, uh, so he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders. And the tribe of the Christians so named after him has not disappeared to this day. Somebody say corroborating evidence. Now he also writes later on about Jesus' brother James. And he tells when James, they were going to kill James. And he says this, Annas, who was the high priest, convened the judges of the Sanhedrin and he brought before them the brother of Jesus who was called the Christ whom, whose name was James and certain others and they tried to stone him but notice he said Jesus who was called the Christ amen so we have independent objective historical corroboration that what the gospels wrote that the writers of the Gospels wrote about Jesus was accurate yeah. amen? amen and I'm gonna give you one last corroborating piece of evidence and that is a uh, the Talmud how many of y'all familiar with the Talmud that's a very important book in Jewish uh, the Jewish faith and it's it's read right alongside the Old Testament and so the Talmud mentions Jesus and it says this now I want you to pay attention the Talmud calls Jesus a false messiah who practiced magic and was justly condemned to death. They also reported rumor that Jesus was born of a Roman soldier and Mary suggesting a Roman soldier and Mary. So now here's what they say. That there was a false messiah, but the messiah thing is still see it's out there. So what they wrote about him is true. There, he's just explaining, giving it a different explanation, like the eclipse and the darkness. The events are not being disputed. Then he says he practiced magic because he did wonders. He healed people. He cast out devils. He raised the dead, and he is ascribing it to magic because he already referred to him as a false messiah. So now this is somebody that has motive to try to denigrate what happened with Jesus. But in his denigration, he is corroborating the events. Now, I want you to also notice they say, it says that they reported a rumor that Jesus was born of a Roman soldier in Mary. So now, what does this, this suggest to you? It suggests to you that there was something unusual about his conception. Right? 
And so what, what they, they concluded, and so what happened was, you all know that Mary, um, that Jesus was, was, uh, she was con- <laughs> that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit placed Jesus inside of Mary's womb. Yeah. And so, so she was in this situation where she was um, socially outcast. Because see, back in that day, unlike this day, having sex and not being married was a big deal. And you were socially ostracized if that was where you were. And so what they concluded was, so what they did was she tells them what happened and they don't believe her. So they say, so what must have happened was you were involved with a Roman soldier because the Romans were hated. The Romans had colonized, if you will, uh, the, the Jewish people. And they hated in fact, a lot of Josephus' book covers the, uh, the contention between the Jews and Romans. Uh, Romans. J- Jewish people hated Romans. So, so they said, well, she must have been involved with a hated Roman. And so she concocted this story so that people wouldn't ostracize her and ostracize her kid. But the truth still remains that there was something unusual about his conception. You follow what I'm saying? So they are corroborating what is included in the Gospels. Somebody say amen. Amen. So so what we have here is this independent evidence, again, that corroborates that the Gospels are accurate. And so looking at the character, the motive, and the actions of the writers of the Gospels, looking at independent, objective evidence, other sources, there is no question that the Gospels are accurate. It's beyond dispute if you're honest and objective and want to just say what it is. Amen? Amen. Now, I want to look up, uh, I want to address now something that is very uh, uh, important, and that is the third concept, which is called, so we got eyewitnesses, we have corroborating witnesses, and the third point I want to look at is adverse witnesses and adverse witnesses are people who tell a different story than what's being reported now one of the things that's interesting about the New Testament is there are absolutely no adverse witnesses from their time now, people have since wrote stuff like, yeah, Jesus, that stuff is all, it didn't happen. But I mean, dude, you, you writing in 1913. These are people, the people that live during that time, there is no adverse testimony. There are no writers. Now, now, think about this. In the Jewish nation, those who didn't follow Jesus considered him a heretic, tried to kill him multiple times, so they were really... Uh, anti Jesus or as Marquis said they were haters <laughs> and the Romans were anti Christians and persecuted Christians severely but what's interesting is from neither of these groups do we find anybody coming out and saying Jesus was not really crucified he, w- he didn't really he wasn't really resurrected from the dead All of this stuff is fake. It it doesn't exist. And so the fact that it doesn't exist, see, if you are anti something and you know these people telling a lie, oh, you're going to say something. Oh, I'm writing. Oh, you wrote that. I'm writing this. It's false. It's fake. And here's why. It doesn't exist. Why does it not exist? Because though people didn't like what was happening, they could not refute what happened. So if you are trying an individual and the eyewitness testimony all matches, the corroborating evidence all matches, and there is no adverse testimony, what's that, what you call it? That's a good case. She's an attorney, she should know. That's a dream case. So here we arrive at the point where the Gospels are credible. You all follow me? Turn to your neighbor and say, the Gospels are credible. 
Now, let me, let me, let me, we have to be clear on this. We're not talking about, see, there's a difference between it being legitimately credible or not credible and people just not wanting to believe it. And see, most of the people, all of the people who say it's not credible fall in one or two camps. The first camp is they've never researched it. And the second camp is they just don't want to believe it. And you know why? You, 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 you know why if you don't want to believe it, you question the authenticity of it? Because see, if you don't question the authenticity of it, then you got to deal with the reality of it. And people don't want to deal with the reality that Jesus is who they say he was, is. And so it's easier just to say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. But the fact that you don't believe it don't change it. I use this example all the time. You don't have to believe gravity. It ain't changing. The fact that people don't like who Jesus was doesn't change who he was. So let's move on now. I want to deal with this as a very important issue, especially in our community. And that is a lot of people of that 46 percent who really who don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. You know where a lot of them fall, that it was changed, that the Bible was altered. How many of you ever heard that? The Bible was altered. So now let's deal with that. And what we want to look at now is was the Bible accurately preserved? Amen. Was it accurately preserved? Because the reality is it was written a long time ago. And so it's okay to say, well, you know, was it really accurately preserved? So if I can prove to you that it was accurately preserved, then those questions go away. Amen. Amen. So now let's begin to look at this. So um, in in the academic circles and in, in, in the circles that deal with historical documents, and the authenticity, authenticity of historical documents, they mainly use two, two tools, two concepts. The first concept is what's called manuscript evidence. And what that means is the book was written so long ago that there are no original copies left. But how many copies, ancient copies, actually do exist? And and not just ancient copies that exist, but ancient copies that all say the same thing. And the more ancient copies of the original that exist, the more reliable the document. This is in academic circles. You follow me? The second principle that is used is what I'm calling date to events or the gap to the actual events. And what that means is The manuscript, find me the earliest manuscript that you have and tell me how far it is from that manuscript was written or was copied to when the events actually happened. And that gap gives you more or less confidence that what we have was accurately preserved. Are you following me? And and so one of the reasons I'm pointing out academic academia is because I was I was listening to a guy and he actually told an account of when he was in college, and I think he might have said this was his first year, one of his professors got up and said, everything you learned in church is a lie. College professor, the Bible is not accurate, it's all fairy tales. College professor, and I've heard that more than once. College campuses are very hostile toward the Christian faith. How many of y'all had a a hostile experience with your faith on a campus? So now, we want to look at how academia performs using these two standards versus how the Bible performs. So, uh, Andrea, I'm sorry I forgot to tell you, but I got slides up there that we need to look at. Uh, Down arrow. So this is manuscript evidence of the authenticity of the New Testament. So now, here we have... Um, classic works that are routinely taught on college campuses and they are accepted and not refuted as as absolutely authentic valid and trustworthy okay and we see now here the, the the evidences that are used in academic circles 
to establish authenticity and reliability. So we have the first one is Caesar's Gaelic Wars, and that was Julius Caesar and the wars that he fought as he ascended to being Caesar of Rome. So the Gaelic, the Gaelic Wars, which are routinely taught on college campuses, and they are trusted historical sources, have 10 manuscripts, 10 ancient manuscripts. And the oldest manuscript is from about 900 AD, which is 1,000 years after the Gaelic Wars. So you all follow me, the, the, the number of manuscripts and the gap. So the, the, the second column and the fourth column are the key columns. Aristotle, how many of y'all ever heard of Aristotle? Yeah, he's got a big reputation on college campuses. The, uh, the number of manuscripts they have for Aristotle is five. Five manuscripts. And the gap between the oldest manuscript and when he actually lived is 1,400 years. And so we'll go down. I'm not going to go through them all. Euripides, how many of y'all ever heard of Euripides? Nine manuscripts, 1,500 year gap. Sophocles' Oedipus. How many of y'all ever heard of Sophocles' Oedipus? Taught on college campuses, respected writings, accepted, respected, taught, nobody questions. Now, Oedipus does a little better. It's got 193 manuscripts. That's looking pretty good. The gap, though, is 1,400 years. So now, let's use their own criteria and look at the New Testament, down arrow. The New Testament has 14,000 manuscripts and the gap from the oldest one to the time that Jesus lived was 85 years. Now you tell me how in the world any college professor has any business disputing the authenticity of the Bible. So what this tells you, either they just didn't do their homework, or they just don't want to believe it. They don't want to deal with the truth of it. But the, the, the evidence of the New Testament dwarfs all of these other classical literature and writings that they accept without question. So I suggest to you that the New Testament is far more authenticated yeah. and reliable than any of these or any other classical work that they put forth as truth on a college campus. Y'all following me? Yeah. Down arrow. This is a quote from uh, a historian. Down arrow again. Down arrow again. <laughs> there we go. Uh, this is a professor, and he says this, the evidence of our New Testament writings is ever so much greater than the evidence for many writings of classical writers, the authenticity of which no one dreams of questioning. And if the New Testament were a collection of secular writings, their authenticity would generally be regarded as beyond all doubt. The only difference is you got to do something with the New Testament. See, Gaelic Wars, you just read it. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, Columbus was cool. I mean, Columbus. Uh, Caesar was cool. He was, he, he was a boss. He was knocking off people left and right. Yeah, I accept that. Oedipus, great stuff. New Testament, nah, we got, because see, that's going to require me to make a decision. That's going to require me to change my life. And so I'm going to ignore the evidence and just say it's fairy tales. That don't make it fairy tales. So we have further evidence to support that it is logical to believe the Bible. Yeah. It's more logical than to, to believe the Bible than any of those other works that we saw. But what's interesting is nobody questions those. So let me, let me, let me do a little something here. Who was the first president of the United States? George Washington? Uh, who was the guy that discovered America? That's why I said discovered. 
Uh, is Alexander the Great, was he a real person? Okay. So here's my question to you. Who's first president? How you know? How you know? Nobody questions that. Ever seen George Washington? You ever seen anybody who's seen George Washington? Have you ever met anybody who knew anybody who knew George Washington? Yet, it's accepted without question. Now, here is the point. If we will accept that at value, why can't we accept this at value? Why is this any different? I ain't never seen George Washington. If he walked past me on the street somehow, I wouldn't know who he was. But you asked me who the first president was, and I'm saying George Washington, just like you. But I don't know that. And so the question to be asked is, why is it that you believe that, but not this? If you believe that simply because it was written, then you can believe this because it was not only written, but it's been authenticated, it's been corroborated, and all other stuff. It's logical to believe the Bible. Y'all follow me? Now, I want to do this and then I'm going to be finished for today. So, so we have seen that the New Testament in particular, the Old Testament, really, nobody disputes the Old Testament. Right. I mean, the Jews use the Old Testament, the Muslims use the Old Testament, the Christians use the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not in dispute. Right. The New Testament exceeds any other historical, classical writing in its evidence. But now let's look at the issue was, has it been accurately preserved for us? Because, okay, I give you that the Bible was accurate, but what about what we have? So, uh, down arrow. So now, what we want to look at is the, the, the church leaders after Jesus' death and resurrection. So we're going to be seeing church leaders starting in around the 65 AD, which is about 30 years after Jesus' death, but in the lifetime of the people who lived. Amen? So, down arrow. So Ignatius, who was the bishop of Antioch, Quotes from 57 of the 27, uh, 15 of the 27 New Testament books. So he, he was a uh, bishop from 70 AD to 110. And he quotes 15 of the 27. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, from 69 to 155, writing to the Philippians. So he was writing to the Philippian church, just like Paul. But he quotes Matthew, Acts, Hebrews, Philippian, and uses phrases from nine of Paul's other letters, next, and first Peter. Arrhenius. 135 to 210 quotes Paul and over 200 quotes from all New Testament books except Philemon, Jude, James, and 3 John. Next. Justin Martyr quotes all four Gospels, all Paul's epistles, and Revelation. Next. Clement of Alexandria. He named all the books of the New Testament except Philemon, James, 2 Peter, 3 John. So now again, this is the church right after Jesus, that, that generation, in, in that generation and right after it. But th they use the same thing we use. Y'all follow me? They consider, they authenticate what we have. Uh, next. Oregon, he named all the Old Testament and New Testament books. Now, here's the clincher. Next. If every Bible in the world was destroyed, if every manuscript was destroyed, we could reconstruct 99.8% of the Bible using quotes from these Old Testament fathers. 99.8%, which is 11 to 17 verses we wouldn't be able to reconstruct. So here's what that means. What we have is exactly what they had. If you want to dispute 11 to 17 verses, go for it. But 99.8% of what we have is what they had. Y'all yeah. follow me? Yes. 
So it has been accurately preserved. So it was accurately written and it's been accurately preserved. Now, here's some further just logic. All right, so we got the hard facts. Now I just want to give you some just good old fashioned logic. If God is real, he is. He created us, he did. Would he not have a responsibility to preserve his instructions to us? Because if you created me and then you put me here and you gave me some instructions and you allowed them to be changed, then you, you have broken your responsibility to me. And see, that's one of the reasons why people want to say it's been changed. Because you know what happens when they say it's been changed? Now nah, I don't have to do it. Or I get to decide what's not been changed and what has been changed. But if your God cannot preserve his instructions, you need to go find a God who can. That's just plain, old-fashioned logic. Amen. But what we're finding, and we will continue, is that what we believe makes sense. It's totally defensible. It is so far from blind faith. In fact, I would go as far as to say it takes more faith to believe something different than the Bible. Believing something different from the Bible requires blind faith. Because once you look at the evidence, believing the Bible, it just makes sense. It makes sense. And so now what we are doing is we are getting the information that we need to always be able to give a defense. Why do you believe in Jesus? And for most of us, you know what it is, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. For most of us, it's because he did this in my life. And that's solid. Yes. But that ain't going to convince some people. Right. <laughs> they can't argue this. Yeah. This cannot be argued. It cannot be disputed. Yeah. And so when people ask me about why I believe, the last thing I mention is what he's done in my life. That's last. Because I'm going to load you up with all this other stuff first. And if you don't accept my testimony, you still got to deal with everything that went before it. And so my thing is, that's the facts. Deal with it. Amen. 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 Stand with me. I'm finished for today.